Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 283 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. 2020 marks an important anniversary for Prince Edward Island and the Canadian Maritime Provinces. 2020 commemorates the 300th anniversary of French presence on Prince Edward Island. Now, like much of North America, the Canadian Maritime Provinces of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia and Cape Breton Island, and Prince Edward Island were highly contested regions during the 17th and 18th centuries. In fact, the way that the French and British fought for presence and control of this region places the Canadian Maritimes among the most contested regions in early North America. Anne-Marie Lane Jonah, a historian with the Parks Canada Agency, joins us to explore the history of Prince Edward Island and why Great Britain and France fought so heavily over the Canadian Maritime region. Now, during our exploration, Anne-Marie reveals the history of Prince Edward Island, including details about the Mi'kmaq people and their homeland, which encompasses Prince Edward Island. How and why the French came to settle Prince Edward Island in 1720? and details about the ways in which the French and British vied for presence and control in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, including details about the Acadians and the Grand Deportation of 1758. But first, did you know that you could get the show notes for each new episode right in your inbox? It's true. If you sign up for the Ben Franklin's World newsletter, every time a new episode releases, I'll send you an email with the details about that episode and its show notes. You can sign up for this newsletter in a really easy fashion. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. That's it. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter, and you can sign up to receive the show notes for each new episode in your inbox. All right. Are you ready to explore the early history of Prince Edward Island? Let's go meet our guest historian. Guest is a historian with the Parks Canada Agency. Her current work supports national historic sites throughout Atlantic Canada and the Historic Sites and Monuments Board. She worked at Fortress Louisbourg for 11 years, and she's the editor of the Journal of the Royal Nova Scotia Historical Society. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Anne Marie Lane Jonah. Thanks, Liz. Now, 2020 marks an important 300th anniversary event in Canada. Anne Marie, Would you start us off by telling us about this event and its important anniversary? Well, 2020 is very special for Prince Edward Island in Atlantic Canada. Prince Edward Island is a province of Atlantic Canada, and it is our smallest province. It's also where the Canadian Confederation began in many ways. But what they're celebrating in 2020 is 300 years of French presence. And even today, a lot of people aren't aware that Prince Edward Island was a French colony, Ile Saint-Jean, for a number of years. And there was a significant French presence there, a colonial presence as well, an Acadian population developed, and that Acadian population, its descendants, some of them are still there and other Acadian descendants, and they are exceedingly proud of this heritage. I know we're going to have fun investigating the French heritage of Prince Edward Island. But before we venture down that path, I wonder if we could start our investigation a bit earlier. Because PEI has a history that extends much earlier than this 300th anniversary. The island does serve as part of the home territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Would you tell us about the Mi'kmaq and what their life was like on Prince Edward Island before the arrival of the French? Sure. I will say that in talking about Mi'kmaq history, I actually consulted with colleagues with El Nue, Prince Edward Island uh, Mi'kmaq Association, because there is a vibrant, active and very important Mi'kmaq community in PEI. So Prince Edward Island is part of the territory of Mi'kmaq, of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory extends actually to the northwest, to the Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec takes in the northern shore and the drainage region of the St. John River to the east of that in New Brunswick. So part of New Brunswick, 
all of what is today Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, the island of Cape Breton, and the southern part of Newfoundland as well. The Mi'kmaq people are a seafaring people, a very mobile people. And so their cycles of life move through all of this territory. These places are all linked and different seasons, different activities take them from one place to the next and have done for millennia in seasonal rounds so that they return to the same places annually, either for hunting, for marine harvest, or for plant harvests, and also for governance, for meetings of the peoples. So the island that we call Prince Edward Island is a begwicked within that, and actually a begwicked, its territory links with the north shore of Nova Scotia, Akpiktuk, which is Picto today. This area, at the end of the last glacial age, Prince Edward Island was actually physically joined with mainland Nova Scotia. This area has changed a lot geologically since the last glacial age. So in many ways, physically, PEI was linked to the mainland in the past. The Mi'kmaq relationship to it dates to that and remembers that in traditions. And still, even though they're now separate land masses, they're very closely connected. The water transport brings them together. So PEI is in a way kind of isolated, but it's a very connected place to all the areas that are close to it. Yeah. Could we talk a bit more about the Mi'kmaq seafaring traditions? What kinds of watercraft did they use in the 17th and 18th centuries? And how did this watercraft and what seems like life at the sea make their semi-nomadic lifestyle possible? The Mi'kmaq canoe is quite a distinct watercraft. There are two styles of canoe, one for seafaring and the other for river travel. They're both made of birch bark and the seafaring one is larger with higher gunnels on the side to deal with waves. The Mi'kmaq did travel between Cape Breton Island and Newfoundland, crossing the entire Gulf of St. Lawrence entrance and out to the Magdalen Islands, as well as between PEI and Nova Scotia. And they hunted marine mammals such as walrus and seals. They also fish extensively and trade extensively. So these watercraft gave them tremendous mobility throughout the era that we know of, and travel on the water remains very important to the Mi'kmaq people. You mentioned trade. As we consider Mi'kmaq life before the arrival of the French, who did they trade with and what did they trade for? The trade of the Mi'kmaq, the river systems from here, connected them further inland. So we have some evidence of a very early movement of people, probably from the Great Lakes region, what is today New England. So people were moving around the larger region well back before Europeans started to come to this area. But the first Europeans to come to what is today Atlantic Canada were the Basque and Portuguese fishermen and whalers who came in the 16th century and still into the 17th century. So long before Europeans started to settle in the area, there was a seasonal round of Europeans arriving And a trade and a bit of linguistic exchange grew up so that by the time the earliest explorers, as we call them, like Cabot and Jacques Cartier, arrived, they met people who were kind of used to Europeans. It also seems like that experience with Europeans must have come in handy around 1720, you know, 300 years ago when the French, who had already established settlements in eastern Canada and the North American Midwest, decided to establish a colony on Ile St. John, or what we know today is Prince Edward Island. Could you tell us what brought the French to Ile St. Jean and why they decided to establish settlements on this part of the Mi'kmaq's homeland? I'm going to take a deep breath because it's a long story. There are two big aspects. There were the economic interest in the area, and then there were political aspects to how the French ended up establishing a colony with a military presence on Ile Saint-Jean. But the French had been for a long time following the Basques and the Portuguese. French fishermen began coming in the 17th century to the Gulf of St. Lawrence region. So there was an economic interest in the area. In the very early 17th century as well, there began to be settlement in the Bay of Fundy, a bit further south. 
with Samuel de Champlain famously and Port Royal. But in the early 17th century, when the French established themselves, within 15 minutes, a competing English settlement arrived and there was a state of war basically between French and English settlers that was on again, off again throughout the entire 17th century or into the early 18th. So when the English colonials defeated the French at Port Royal on the Bay of Fundy in what's today Nova Scotia in 1710, for many of this small but very well-established agricultural colony that had grown up in this really unstable, highly contested trading colony, these people were identifying more with the place than they were identifying with any colonial leaders, which kept changing over and over again. So these people stayed, even though they were French-speaking people, Roman Catholic, when it went back to English hands, that colony became a colony with English political control, but French occupants. At the same time, when the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 settled that the war of the Spanish succession and that particular round of fighting, the mainland of Nova Scotia, which to the French had been Acadie, honestly, in the time period, the British constantly describe it as Acadia or Nova Scotia. It is so unsettled. It has two names at the time that once that population accepted that the British had taken control, but they wanted to remain on their farms and the places they were established. And they worked out an approach of neutrality, a strange sort of independence that allowed that to continue. But the French did want to maintain, for economic reasons, for the fishery and for political reasons, a presence. So the treaty had left them the islands in the Gulf which are the islands today we call Cape Breton, Prince Edward Island, the Magdalene Islands. So the French wanted to establish their presence on the islands that they'd been left. The French also lost Plaisance in Newfoundland, their fishing port there. So what resources they had from Newfoundland and from the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia, they moved to Cape Breton. Also, with Ile Saint-Jean, what the French saw was they were able to get their French population from Newfoundland to come to Cape Breton, no problem. They were not able to interest their agricultural population, the colonists in the Bay of Fundy area in Cape Breton. It's not agricultural. It didn't suit them. So one thing that Ile Saint-Jean offered was a possible lure for that population. At the same time, it was territory they controlled, so they wanted to make sure they controlled it. And it also was a very important place for the Mi'kmaq and a good place to build connections with the Mi'kmaq. So they had some settlement interest, but they had as much strategic interest in establishing a presence on Ile Saint-Jean. But truthfully, that interest didn't come until they had lost mainland Nova Scotia. It's really interesting that this region was so highly contested. I mean, I know we can say that about a lot of different regions in North America during the 17th and 18th centuries, but this region of the Canadian Maritimes seems to be very volatile and highly contested. Do we happen to know what the Mi'kmaq made of this European contest over their homelands? It is a fascinating history and one that I approach with caution myself as a non-Mi'kmaq scholar, because many Mi'kmaq scholars are bringing a lot of new perspective and thought to an area that colonial scholars have tended to go at without the deep cultural understanding that really gives this kind of speculation meaning. But truly, there's a fascinating amount in the communications between the British and French governors and the Mi'kmaq leadership, strong expressions of independence of maintaining this is their territory. The Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 divided up all of Mi'kmaq without any reference to the Mi'kmaq at all. So shortly after that, when the British began to assert their presence, there was a response from, and I think this is uh, Wabanaki, this is New Brunswick, one of the first responses of a sort of ceremonial expression of what the hell are you talking about? (laughs) This is my territory. No one gives it away. The French king didn't own it. The French king can't give it away. 
So throughout Mi'kmaq, throughout the entire Wabanaki Confederacy of the indigenous group that we call Penobscot, Willistokuyuk as well, there was a unification to express opposition to what was happening. And that became what we often call Dummer's War, Dummer being the governor of Massachusetts at the time. And all of these indigenous nations resisted, fought back. There was a lot of indigenous piracy at this time, actually, a lot of attacks on New England fishermen. It was one of the principal means of expressing opposition. But there were also attacks on land and there were a lot of confrontations. So as we're talking about Dummer's War and this resistance going on, the other thing that the French are thinking about as they establish themselves at Ile Saint-Jean to be closer to the Mi'kmaq is that this benefits the French when the indigenous nations make things very difficult for the British. So the French are always happy to encourage, to support, to be present for this, even though they're staying out of it because they cannot afford another war. So one of their intentions is definitely to maintain a strong relationship with the First Nations. And the place name Skamagan actually means the waiting place. And why it acquired that name is that it was the location where the French built a very small fortification, but it was also where the French governor came annually to meet with the Mi'kmaq leadership to express their ongoing friendship through ceremonies and through gifts and to encourage the continued positive relationship between the Mi'kmaq and the French. It's more complex than to simply say they were allies because it was a constantly reinforced, negotiated, and very independent on the Mi'kmaq side relationship. But there was an ongoing diplomatic communication between the French and the Mi'kmaq. And this was something the British struggled with. There is also the religious difference because the Mi'kmaq, many had accepted Catholicism. They had not completely abandoned their own religion, but they had this syncretic spiritual practice that continued Mi'kmaq religion and made links with Catholicism. So there was a great deal more shared practice between the Mi'kmaq and the French and shared language. The French were very good at learning Mi'kmaq. The British were not. So there are all these things that created relationship between the French and the Mi'kmaq that did not exist between the British and the Mi'kmaq. And the British just were pros at the diplomatic faux pas. I don't want to say they had a bad attitude, but they definitely, whenever they attempted diplomacy, they really had issue with gift ceremonies. They saw it as handouts and it made them annoyed and they were very reluctant to participate. So they did not approach this with the relationship building or respect that the French had learned they had to employ. And so the unsuccessful diplomacy between the British and the Mi'kmaq led to conflict and was something that the French could not have been anything but pleased with, that the British may have won and gained by treaty the region, but they still far from controlled it. Do you have a sense of why such differences existed between the French approach to maintaining relations with the First Nations peoples and the British approach to these relations? and why the French and British approaches were just so different from each other? It's an awfully good and huge question. I suspect that one element of the French approach may simply have been the very slow arrival of the French, that they did not arrive as a significant military force with a big political ambition. The initial French arrivals were very, very small trading forts, Nicolas Denis, Charles, Saint-Étienne de la Tour. And these people had forts, had very small trading centers, and they didn't really have political ambitions. And I think it is also significant that there was an evangelical side to the French. They brought missionaries and they were interested in spreading Catholicism. It's another whole thesis of the relationship of the Mi'kmaq to Catholicism. But these things created cultural connections. And even in the very early period with the French, with the Acadians, there was some intermarriage. So there were all sorts of cultural connections, lots more opportunity 
to have a more subtle understanding. Uh, it certainly wasn't, you know, they arrived and they were buddies right from the start. It's a process. But the British came later and their interest was much, much more political than economic. Mostly they wanted to control the area so that there was a buffer between the French and New England. So they wanted to control it, but they invested in a very limited way in controlling it and were much more military. That would be my humble theory. <laughs> that I think there's lots of room for it. It's an interesting discussion, but it's a fascinating period. It was so intensely contested at that time, and particularly the 18th century, because when the Treaty of Utrecht happened, that particular defeat of the French there was no reason to think at the time that that was final, that that was going to stick for a significant amount of time. But it actually created a situation that continued for more than a generation before conflict broke out again. You know, it's a long period of peace to have 30 years without an actual war between the British and the French at that time. But there was a war with the indigenous people in the middle of it. So Peace is a pretty relative concept, but it's an era of, there was a great deal of conflict and it just is really interesting to read the communications of individual officials and how they evaluated it and how they approached it. There are some fascinating diplomats who did amazing jobs. Paul Mascarin comes to mind. He was a British governor, but was a Huguenot, so a French speaker, and was tremendous at sort of bridging these cultural gaps, whereas others, not so good. <laughs> so it sounds like the settlement of Ile Saint-Jean happened during this period of great cultural, political, and religious contestation, which makes us wonder, how did the French settlement of Ile Saint-Jean develop amidst all this conflict from 1720 forward? There are two really distinct periods of development of Ile Saint-Jean. What the French did initially is they sort of undid all I was saying about their subtle bit-by-bit -bit approach and all of that, and they reverted to the old charter party model. And they actually, when they established Ile Saint-Jean, the first thing they did was grant a charter company to the Comte de Saint-Pierre to bring immigrants and settle it. And so completely different from the Bay of Fundy, the original Acadie model of small groups building up small agricultural areas, they wanted to try to have a wealthy sponsor, somebody who was actually a courtier of Versailles, bring this group of people. It didn't work. So Ile Saint-Jean grew quite slowly as a population. There was a garrison there to hold the position. There was a commandant present for maintaining Mi'kmaq relations. There were missionaries, and there were some Acadians who did choose to move away from the British-controlled area to a French-controlled area. And there were these attempts at companies, the Comte de Saint-Pierre, and then on the east side of the island, Jean-Pierre Roma, a little bit later, who was a nut. So he tries to build this plantation. He actually had been in Saint-Domingue earlier in his career. So he's bringing skills that he had from Haiti to try to establish something. And it was very ambitious and it was a spectacular failure. So it grew slowly and very strangely because of these attempts at charter companies, but of small and again, very well integrated with the environment and with the existing Mi'kmaq population of Acadians did move in that direction. So up until the 1740s, you probably have a civilian population that still hasn't reached a thousand people in a few small spots, one particularly further west, Malpec was very close to an indigenous community. I know of one Pierre Arsenault who had been at Beaubassin in Nova Scotia, and he moved there and began farming there, but was also a trader with the Mi'kmaq. So you see sort of a, a mix of economies coming together, but it was really, really slow growing until the 1740s. And then once again, we have war between the British and the French. <laughs> And at this time, after this particular war, the fortress of Louisbourg fell. There was a period of British control, or New England control, really, but British control. But then by treaty, it was all returned to France again. 
And when Ile Saint-Jean and Ile Royale went back to France this time, a lot more Acadians were a lot more concerned about how this being neutral in British territory thing was working out. And you suddenly, the Acadian population is Acadians from the Bay of Fundy moving in pretty significant numbers towards Ile Saint-Jean, where they can farm, where they can live as they had, but be in French territory. So before that war, it was very small, slow growing, and some really interesting financial ventures. And then after the Acadian agricultural population started to move towards Ile Saint-Jean, and the population really exploded. From your description, I really get the sense that if you were living on Ile Saint-Jean between 1720 and the 1740s, that life was either really boring and hard, you know, filled with the hard work of agriculture and settlement building, or life was pretty terrifying because you really do have these periods of recurring warfare. (laughs) Well, I guess, you know, ideas of entertainment are different in different eras. But what you would have, especially for the few groups who came from the Chignecto Bobessin region very early on, there was Michel Haché de Galan, was one of the first settlers who was Acadian, but he has sort of a long colonial pedigree. And the Arsenault. So you have some well established Acadian colonial families who know the region well, who are choosing to establish on Ile Saint Jean. So for them, I mean, I still think for any 18th century person, the idea that there is land available to them that could be their own is quite an astonishing concept. I mean, they approach this with communication with the Mi'kmaq. We do have evidence that generally Acadian communities, when expanding, communicated with the Mi'kmaq or would describe the territory they took as with permission from the Mi'kmaq or purchased from the Mi'kmaq. So they are moving in a way that's not going to provoke hostility or any angry reaction from the Mi'kmaq, they've got a lot of work to do. There's no question. At the same time, these guys are all really mobile, even the Acadians. Everybody's moving along the coasts. They're trading. They will encounter people from Louisbourg. They will encounter people from New England. There are a lot of people moving around. They're mixing together different economies. And at the same time, traditional culture that they've carried from France obviously endures very well because we still have so much of it. So I would not doubt for a moment that these guys all worked extremely hard, but every member of the family would have to work hard to make these things function. But it's not an isolated, absolutely unchanging existence. Like there's a lot of interaction and connection with the world in all of these places because of the mobility that comes from being maritime people. Now that we have such a good idea of how the French settled Ile Saint-Jean, why they settled it, I wonder if we could now talk about the Acadians who really helped establish this colony on Ile Saint-Jean. Now, the Acadians were part of the French settlement, but I do sometimes get the sense that the French and the Acadians were really kind of two different types of people by the mid-18th century. Could you tell us about Acadian identity and whether there were any differences between the Acadians and the French? Particularly in the early generations, sometimes when I'm talking about this, it feels like a pretty subtle difference between Acadian and French. But by the time you're in the mid 18th century, the Acadians are a group who have been for multi generations generally established in the Atlantic Canadian region, who are really more attached to and invested in this region. They still very much think of themselves as people from France, and there is loyalty to the king amongst some of them, I wouldn't say all, but they are distinct from the colonial administrators, the merchants, the soldiers who are coming and going from France. The colonial investments of Louisbourg and of Ile Saint-Jean and Port La Joie bring people who will come in for periods of time, but who are fundamentally French and expect to return to France. So I think that uh, it is a big question how much Acadian identity was there before the deportation of the Acadians. You definitely would not have people say, hi, I'm Acadian so much. It tends to be a term we apply retroactively. Habitant and habitant the neutral French was something that the British would say quite often. 
the French versus the neutral French. So they had terms that did distinguish this group of people, many of whom remained in British territory, but remained culturally French people. But within the colonies of Ile Saint-Jean and Ile Royale, you do see people referred to as Acadien, distinguishing them from the more recent settlers or from the fishermen who will come and go between France and the colony. So it sounds like Acadien was really a developing form of French American identity. You know, just as people in British America called themselves Americans, even though identifying as American didn't mean relinquishing a British identity. Yes, I would say that's a good analogy. Now, Amory mentioned the Grand Deportation, which began in 1758 during the French and Indian or Seven Years' War. And I want us to talk about this event. But first, I think we should take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. And then I think we need to discuss the impact of the Seven Years' War on the French settlement of Ile Saint-Jean. Can you imagine what it must have been like to establish a new colonial settlement? Lots of hard work, for sure. And perhaps a scarcity of supplies as you waited for supply ships or the trading season with the Mi'kmaq. Now, while scarcity may have been an issue for the early French settlers on Prince Edward Island, scarcity of content is not something you have to worry about when it comes to Ben Franklin's world. The Omohundro Institute and I are committed to producing this podcast and to helping you discover and learn more about history and the early American past. Now, just because we're committed to this podcast doesn't mean we don't need your help to keep it going. In fact, we could really use your help to keep it going. This is why we created the Ben Franklin's World subscription program. This program, which you can find at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe, asks you to help support our work at less than $3 per episode. In exchange for that support, we're offering subscribers a monthly bonus episode and ad-free versions of each new episode going forward. Now, one of the questions you've asked me about the subscription program is, will everyone need to become a subscriber to receive new episodes? The answer is no. We will still release new episodes into the feed every other Tuesday like clockwork. However, if you can support us, it would be great to welcome you as one of our subscribers. Your financial and moral support really means a lot to us, and it allows us to continue our work to make this podcast and to make it available to everyone who wants to access it. Please become a subscriber. Join our subscription program at benfranklinsworld.com slash subscribe. Emery, would you tell us about the impact the Seven Years' War had on the French settlement of Ile Saint-Jean? Absolutely. I mean, the Seven Years' War, which technically was declared in 1756, but which began in this region absolutely in 1755 or even earlier, some would argue 1750. This war completely reshaped the region. And I mean, for Canadians, the Seven Years' War is the war that in 1759, Quebec fell. So it is the war that brought about the fall of New France. And the deportation is part of that. The deportation I would describe as taking place between 1755 and 1762. A lot of people understand it, especially if they are fans of Longfellow or have visited Grand Pré in Nova Scotia. The 1755, it's even the name of a band. It's a very well-known date. That was the principal year. But it was a process that actually continued for multiple years. So as I'd been describing, this group of people were culturally French, striving to be neutral, living in British territory, which at any time is tricky in the 18th century, is an incredibly ambitious political goal to have it be accepted that one would live in an area. And basically, the neutrality that they strove to have was that they were willing to swear an oath to the British king of loyalty as long as they did not have to agree to take up arms. And as far as kings were concerned in the 18th century, that's kind of what the people are for, is they're there to take up arms if you need them. So they actually managed to pull that off for a number of years for different reasons, Mostly that the British didn't have the forces in the region to force them to do otherwise. And they produced a lot of very useful food. So they managed to get away with being neutral for a number of years. But as I mentioned, when war broke out in the 1740s, then they were truly caught. Some of the neutral French supported the French cause when the French attacked the British at Annapolis Royal. 
Annapolis Royal did not fall. The Fortress of Louisbourg did fall, Louisbourg, to try to stick to the French pronunciation, but was returned to the French. So any tensions that had been below the surface that had been managed were now exploding in the late 1740s. As I'd said, many Acadians did flee to Ile Saint-Jean. So one of the things was there was a border dispute between the French and British in this region, very close to Ile Saint-Jean at the Strait of Chignecto, which joins Nova Scotia to New Brunswick today, and actually recently just became a patrolled border again because of COVID-19. There had been no patrols on that border for centuries, <laughs> and suddenly they're back. But this border dispute that erupted in this area, again, the Acadians found themselves caught. The Mi'kmaq also were brought back. They had managed to, after Dummer's War, negotiate and achieve a peace and friendship treaty with the British that had terms for how they would coexist. Everything fell apart post the War of Austrian Succession, and the British returned really with a resolve to take control of the region. And this resolve to take control of the region meant that everything that had been allowed to kind of keep going, even though it was kind of an odd situation, anything that the Mi'kmaq had negotiated for coexistence that they felt would continue into the future all suddenly became in dispute again. And when the war broke out, the British sent troops, the French sent troops to Chignecto. The Acadians and the Mi'kmaq resisted. There was a very long standoff at Chignecto. Really, all of the troops arrived in 1750. The siege of the French fort Beausejour happened in 1755. So for five years, there was this standoff of British and French troops Acadians absolutely caught in the middle, Mi'kmaq at the ready, resisting the British at every possible turn. And once the war seemed inevitable, what happened in 1755, in fact, was the British decided they were going to attack Beausejour, end this standoff. They brought 2,000 troops from New England, and it took them three days to defeat Beausejour. When they defeated Beausejour, they were very convinced that the Acadians had been supporting the French. They were very frustrated with that situation that it continued. And they also had 2,000 troops that hadn't had to work very hard. So they had the resources available. And this was a decision taken without the support of the Board of Trade, without the support of the British Crown. The Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia decided to use these resources to deport the Acadian population once and for all. So that began, and actually, July 28th was the 265th anniversary of that decision that the British decided to take this drastic step to end this strange situation that had persisted really since 1710. And so they used the forces, soldiers who had been brought for a siege on a fort, had been recruited for that were suddenly informed they were going to be rounding up civilians and burning down their houses. And Winslow's diary is, there are incredible accounts of this horrific period. And I think it is a memory, it is a knowledge, it's scars on the landscape that 265 years later, people still feel is still very powerful, very difficult to live with part of our history. So British soldiers and New England militiamen they made the decision to start the Grand Deportation as a way of permanently ending this border dispute with the French. And it also sounds like to end their discomfort with the neutral French. Now, when scholars have looked at the Grand Deportation, just how many people have they found that were removed from Nova Scotia and Ile Saint-Jean by the British and New English? And where did the British and New English send the Acadians or neutral French? So. In what is today mainland Nova Scotia, the heart of Acadie, about six or 7,000 people were displaced. Some of them fled towards New Brunswick. Many of them fled to Ile Saint-Jean. But still, about 7,000 were deported towards the Anglo-American colonies. And Beaubassin, the region around Fort Beausejour, were considered to be the most troublesome. So they were deported the furthest south. They were sent to South Carolina and Georgia, 
And probably people from that region are aware that there are no significant Cajun or Acadian populations there. And it's because when those people arrived, they immediately began to move again. So in fact, some of them actually within a year had made their way back to Acadia. Others had fled along the Atlantic coast and some ended up in Massachusetts waiting out the war. But what's truly incredible about this group of people is that some of those people who were deported to South Carolina made their way back to Ile Saint-Jean. So war is finally fully declared. A truly huge squadron is sent to attack Louisbourg. And in 1758, they succeed. Louisbourg is defeated. So Ile Saint-Jean surrenders because it has only a tiny fortification. It's not a significant military outpost. So there's no battle there. It simply surrenders because Louisbourg has been defeated. And the British then move to continue the deportation, to deport the Acadian population of Ile Saint-Jean, which they guessed would be about 1,000 people. It was actually about 4,000 people by that time because so many people who had fled were at Ile Saint-Jean. So the deportation there that began in the fall of 1758 By the time they rounded up enough ships, it was into November that people were sailing across the Atlantic. Many from there actually had fled towards Quebec. Some tried to flee to New Brunswick, where people had fled before, but the situation there was so dire that they returned to be deported rather than stay. And when that particular deportation took place, and I will say all of the deportations have a significant death toll. It is an arduous process, simply the people being loaded on the ships, the crowded ships traveling. But from Ile Saint-Jean, two of the ships sank and entire families, entire extended families were lost. The family name Noel is one that I know of that people say that all of the family was lost in this. At least 600, probably more, were lost in those two ships sinking. And the rest of the civilian population there, this deportation did not head towards the American colonies because it was a French colony that was defeated. They were deported to France. So this group of people went to Saint-Malo in France and went to the west coast of France, where they then, having never seen France in their lives, many of them, their parents had never seen France. It was many generations removed. So they had language ties, cultural ties, they understood each other, but still it was a very foreign place. So that was how the Seven Years' War led to the deportation from Ile Saint-Jean and also from Ile Royale. The population there was also deported. And then the Seven Years' War kept rolling on. The Atlantic colonies defeated. The next target was Quebec. And that was where they went the following year. And the history played out. But truly, the deportation itself, even after Ile Saint-Jean, many of the people who fled, particularly towards what is New Brunswick today, there was a long and brutal process of rounding them up and finding them and destroying their refugee communities and arresting them and deporting them. And it wasn't until in 1762, a group of such prisoners was sent to Boston and Boston finally said, no and insisted that they be sent back. So with that, the deportation stopped, but it was a multi-year process, incredibly brutal. Wow. It really sounds like from your description that the British went after the Acadians for their neutrality, and that's what sparked the decision to deport them from their homelands in Canada. And what I find really interesting about this story is, you know, thinking a little further ahead here, is that we don't really hear of the British deporting French and French Acadians from Quebec, when Quebec falls in 1759. Do we know why the difference in treatment here? Yeah, it is quite interesting how differently those two things played out. And I will say, I know that some people have researched the communications and thought about it a lot more than I have, but I am aware that truly, it really partially is the Acadian experience and the size of the colony of Canada that will become Quebec that it's realized immediately that it's just impractical. They can't do it. It's just unthinkable. It's much, much larger population and it would be unimaginably catastrophic. So they recognized with that and it began a real shift. I mean, the Acadian deportation was quite a horrifying undertaking 
And many of the people involved in it, many of the people who are writing journals and accounts are really unhappy to be part of this. So I can imagine voices like, this is unthinkable to try. They definitely treated the population of Canada quite brutally. And a lot of homes and farms, et cetera, were destroyed in 1759, as well as the siege. But they did not make that decision. And they were back in some ways where they were in 1710, trying to figure out how to run this colony that was entirely inhabited by a population that was to them foreign. What did the deportation of Acadians mean for those who lived on Ile St. Jean and for the Mi'kmaq people who had forged what sounds like a fairly decent relationship with the Acadians? Well, I cannot imagine life on Ile St. Jean between 1755 and 1758 where all of those deportations had happened, where people began to try to return. People had a sense of what was going on, but France just did not have a capacity and there was no stopping it. So they were aware of how fraught the situation was. They actually did send a missionary to make a plea when Louisbourg fell to be allowed to remain. And they were told, no, they would not be allowed to remain and they would be deported. Throughout all of this, for the Mi'kmaq, it's just incredible traumatic disruption because this war is happening in Mi'kmaq places, Mi'kmaq communities. The capacity to live is disastrously impacted by all that is taking place, being able to hunt, being able to move by the sea. Everything that people did to live was affected by this. And at the same time, also people that they had connections with were suffering tremendously. There's a sense that the Mi'kmaq endeavored to help when they could. I've seen some oral histories of just finding people who had fled into the woods and had nowhere to go and bringing them to one of the refugee communities. Many of the refugee communities in New Brunswick were actually close to Mi'kmaq mission communities. So there was a great awareness. There's also one communication with the British of you guys have got to do something about all these refugees because they don't have any food and now we're starving because there were, I would estimate, over 2,000, more than 2,000 people living as refugees in what is today New Brunswick. The entire region was so profoundly disrupted by all of this. It had huge impact on the Mi'kmaq as well. You know, sometimes when we reach these big anniversary points, you know, the 300th anniversary of this or the 400th anniversary of that, when we reach these anniversary points, there sometimes tends to be a lot of celebration. But it also seems like from the history that we've just been discussing that perhaps AKD 300 is more of a commemoration in Canada than a celebration. So would you tell us about the 300th anniversary of French settlement in Prince Edward Island and how Canada is marking this event? Well, actually, for the Acadians of Ile Saint-Jean, of PEI, and myself as an historian of the 18th century, I dwell upon and I think about these things. And there's an awareness and an acknowledgement. But the anniversary of the 300th year of French presence will be celebrated in August to coincide with the arrival and also to coincide with the Acadian National Day of August 15th. And it's a celebration of the persisting community, the Acadian community of Prince Edward Island today. So in fact, it is a celebration, really, that all of this is an important part of identity and of story. But when people get together, it is about Acadian culture that has survived all the years in between and that is still very vibrant. Now, Emery, you are a historian for the Parks Canada Agency. And I wonder if you would tell us about some of the historic sites and programs that Parks Canada has about the Acadians and the 18th century history of Canada. We have a number of sites that address different aspects of Acadian history. And I will say, of course, with 2020, everything is playing out a little differently than we imagined it would a year ago. So for starters, it does mean for people who are unable to travel, there is a lot of online presence. The Acadians of Prince Edward Island actually have a website for celebrating and the Skamagan, Port Lachois, Fort Amherst National Historic Site will also have activities and information and things that people can connect to 
on their website. And our other very large Acadia National Historic Site is Grand Pre. And that also has different activities associated with their website. So I will just throw in that the statue of Evangeline, which is quite iconic, is 100 years old this year. So we are also celebrating her birthday. And those sites, they're becoming open for outdoor visits as well. So it is possible for Canadians who are in the region to be able to visit the sites. But throughout Parks Canada's system, there's also Fort Anne, which was Port Royal, was the French capital up until 1710. So the history interpreted there is also very interesting. And they also have some information available on their website. And the Société Nationale Acadienne, which is English and French websites, they have a tremendous amount of information about this history. And if anybody really wants to dig in, a prof in Ontario, I'm not going to guess at his university, Daniel Sampson and his class this year, once they discovered that they were doing the rest of the year in quarantine, created a tremendous web page on the 1758 deportation. So there's a really cool resource out there, really recently created by students. But there's a tremendous amount online written about this really complex, tragic history. And I will say the Mi'kmaq Confederacy of Prince Edward Island, MCPEI, and El Nue, which is the Mi'kmaq Association, both have also websites that have history that people can dig into to understand that better as well. Don't worry. I'll include links to all the historic sites and associations that Amory just mentioned in the show notes so that you can visit them at your convenience. So don't worry about having to remember all the different names that Amory just said. We should really jump into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. In your opinion, what might have happened if the French had retained control of Ile Saint-Jean and won the Seven Years' War? How might the history of Prince Edward Island and Maritime Canada be different? I can kind of feel some people out there with broad smiles on their faces right now. But it is it's such an interesting question because there were so many external factors that drove French and British behavior at the time and had such an impact on this region. But on the other hand, it's one colonialism or another colonialism. So how profoundly different would it have been in the region, really? Because the British and French were incredibly active when they were fighting with each other, and then were both fairly negligent when they weren't fighting with each other over the region, so that the people who stayed and the Mi'kmaq really were more driving what happened in the region. It certainly would have been utterly different because for the Mi'kmaq, the loss of French presence had a profound effect on the relationship with the British. It was a process that took quite a long time, but perhaps the 19th century would have played out a great deal differently. My French would be better, but in a sense, it is like one colonialism for another. So how that would have played out for the people in the region which I'm really struck that when I'm working on exhibits and when we're working on presenting the history, that the people that I'm working with are Acadian and Mi'kmaq, and there aren't any British or French really around much. However, if the French had won, I think it would have had an enormous impact on American history, because truly, it was the loss of the French as a threat and an enemy And the British policy post the Seven Years' War of placing a limit on colonial expansion in Indigenous territory, two things that came out of the Seven Years' War, these, I think, were contributing factors to the environment that made the American Revolution possible. So if the French had won and it had remained a British-French area, that may not have happened at that time or in that way. (laughs) 
Yeah. Now I'm thinking about the overtures the Americans made to the Canadians during the revolution. You know, the United States really wanted Canada to join them in the revolution and in their fight for independence. And if France had won the Seven Years' War, well, I'm not sure that those overtures would have happened. You know, if they did, they might have been different. And we can't even say that the revolution would have happened. Yes, the Americans were always deeply nervous of the French in any location. The French were perceived as an enormous threat, whether or not they actually were. So sort of that, and we don't need the British attitude may have been a little different. Now, before we conclude, does Parks Canada have any exciting exhibits or events coming up for post-COVID times or maybe some virtual events that we can look forward to and participate from home? We do have a lot happening online right now, but we have been working really hard on exhibits and we'll keep working on exhibits. We are going to have so much for people to do when they can. The Halifax Citadel, which is a major historic site, will be opening a new exhibit very soon that really addresses in a very broad way the impact of the British presence on the region. So it's a really in-depth, broad view that has been developed working closely with the Mi'kmaq. So there's original art as well. So it's a very visual, it's going to be a very cool exhibit. We've also been working with Northern New Brunswick developing a traveling exhibit on the history of Chignecto, which might be why I referred to that region quite a bit in this talk, because I've been working, and that is very closely connected with the history of PEI. And it's going to be a very interactive very visual, very family-friendly, small exhibit that will be able to travel to different places. And also coming up in the near future is on Prince Edward Island, Province House, which is the active government building, but is also the building where the first Confederation Conference took place. It's been undergoing a major restoration, and it will open with a new exhibit in 2022. Fantastic. And if we have more questions about the history of Ile saint jean or Canadian history in general, how can we get in contact with you or with one of your Parks Canada colleagues? Truly, if you simply Google Parks Canada and then look for info and then ask your question, our trusty web folks will make sure that it gets directed. If you just say, I want to talk to an historian about this, it will get sent to one of us for sure. Emery Lane Jonah, Thank you for speaking with us and for taking us through the history of Ile Saint-Jean and the grand deportation of the Acadians. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Long before the French and British arrived in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the Mi'kmaq people enjoyed a fruitful, seafaring life that allowed them to live across parts of Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland. These seafaring traditions placed the Mi'kmaq in a position to meet the Basque and Portuguese fishermen who came to fish in their waters which means that by the time the French arrived in what was then New France and what is now Eastern Canada and the Canadian Maritime Provinces, the Mi'kmaq were fairly used to Europeans. Now, the French seem to have appreciated the Mi'kmaq's openness to trading with them. And the Mi'kmaq, they seem to have appreciated how the French wanted to forge trade relationships and cultural connections rather than a political dominance over them. However, it wasn't long after the French arrived in Canada that the British followed them. And the British? Well, they looked to achieve political dominance over all the lands they colonized. The French and British had been embroiled in a centuries-long rivalry, and they carried this rivalry with them across the Atlantic to North America and to the Caribbean, where it manifested in four wars for empire. In the United States, we know these wars as King William's War between 1688 and 1697, Queen Anne's War, the War of Spanish Succession, 1702 to 1713, King George's War, the War of Austrian Succession, 1744 to 1748, and the French and Indian or Seven Years' War between 1754 and 1763. In each of these wars, the French and British fought each other, as did their respective Native American or First Nation allies. At the end of Queen Anne's War in 1713, the Treaty of Utrecht tried to end the fighting by divvying up territories. The treaty permitted the British to possess Nova Scotia and the French to possess Cape Breton Island, where the French established Fortress Louisbourg, and Prince Edward Island, where they tried to establish fishing and agricultural communities. As Amory related, establishing French settlement on Ile Saint-Jean, or Prince Edward Island, was slow and hard work. The French settlers on Nova Scotia, the Acadians, had formed a real attachment to their land, and they didn't want to leave, 
which prompted them to try and establish a policy of neutrality with their new British rulers. But after King George's War in the 1740s, French settlement on Ile Saint-Jean exploded, as many Acadians fled Nova Scotia after that war. Now, as a French presence on Ile Saint-Jean was primarily one of agricultural settlement, numbering around 4,000 inhabitants, the French were forced to capitulate and cede the island to the British after the fall of Fortress Louisbourg in 1758. With a quick succession of military victories under their belt, the British had the manpower and the time to do something they had wanted to do since 1713, and that was to rid their Canadian territories of the French. And so without asking permission from London, the British military and their New England allies began deporting the French populations of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Cape Breton Island, and Ile Saint-Jean. Known as the Grand Deportation, this forcible removal of the Acadians took place over four or five years. Now, as the Acadians of Nova Scotia lived within British territory, they were sent to other British colonies in North America and the Caribbean. As the Acadians of Cape Breton Island and Ile Saint-Jean lived in French territory, they were sent back to France, a place that these Acadian families hadn't seen for several generations. As Anne-Marie related, this forced removal was hard and difficult. In fact, that's an understatement. Families were separated, ships sank and hundreds were killed, and the deported never really felt at home in their new destinations, which caused many to do whatever they needed to do to return to Acadie. And this brings us to 2020. 300 years ago, the French began establishing a presence on Prince Edward Island. As we learned today, many of these French settlers were Acadiens, which makes this 300th anniversary not only a commemoration, but a celebration of the persistence of French culture and French families on Prince Edward Island and throughout Maritime Canada. Against strong odds, French and Acadian people and culture have persisted in Canada. You'll find more information about Parks Canada, its historic sites, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 283. Please become a Ben Franklin's World subscriber and help us continue our work to make this podcast and to make it available to everyone who wants to access it. Join us at BenFranklinsWorld.com slash subscribe. That's BenFranklinsWorld.com slash subscribe. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's digital audio team, Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, what other aspects of early Canadian history would you like to learn about? Let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.